let us uh, begin the third part of uh, our uh, conference, uh, NATO Talk uh, 2023, panel of four, global rivalry, rivalries, and as uh, Frau God uh, uh, said, let us take into the future. Um, our Minister Pistorius uh, said already that uh, we are going in the future turning point. Uh, what should we do with um, uh, India? Uh, strategic uh, partnerships, uh, new uh, situation uh, concerning China, Russia, of course, Iran, who put out their feelers. Uh, so, what is uh, the strategic uh, competition for Europe uh, and uh, uh, what can we do in Europe and the United States uh, in order to defend our values? Uh, and uh, these are the questions uh, which we will deal with uh, in our uh, this uh, panel and uh, our keynote speaker for this session uh, is um, uh, Colonel uh, Frank Hagemann, who joined uh, the George C. Marshall Center for Security Studies in March 2022. Uh, then uh, Katrin uh, Bastin, a professor, uh, also at the George C. Marshall uh, Center. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to invite you um, on the podium and uh, we are ready to listen to your presentations and discuss them afterwards. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we uh, talked um, a lot about uh, current uh, topics in security uh, policy, uh, panel fourth, as you uh, heard, is devoted uh, to international uh, politics, uh, but uh, from a different point of view. We will talk about a, a topic, what the security policy uh, will be in the next uh, decades, uh, what will be, uh, what will shape it. And it is strategic competition. We uh, heard on many occasions that the world uh, older, uh, undergoes a dramatic uh, change, and uh, it's a rivalry between uh, USA and uh, China. Russia also plays a role, but as um, our uh, president uh, of uh, our uh, Office of Protection of the Constitution, Thomas uh, Hadlenwang, said that uh, Russia is a tempest, China is a climate change. But we are talking not about the weather phenomena, but we'll uh, talk about the political climate change. And we'll talk not only uh, China, but we'll start with China. The rise of uh, China changes the international system, and uh, this process will continue. Some observers uh, say um, uh, or talk about the new Cold War, uh, which will split the world into a new East and West. Until 1990, we had a bipolar system. Uh, on one uh, side, democratic uh, countries in the Euro Atlantic uh, space under the leadership of the United States. Uh, on the other side uh, was the communist uh, bloc under the leadership of the Soviet Union. Today, democratic countries um, are confronted again by authoritarian regimes. But there are differences. China is without doubt is the strongest uh, power on the other side. But unlike the Soviet Union, uh, China does not have a big alliance. The United States are still a leading power in NATO. But 
uh, China is uh, outside the area of responsibility of uh, this alliance. And uh, looking and, uh, uh, at Indo-Pacific uh, space, there is no pendant um, towards NATO. The United States um, maintain bilateral uh, secu um, security policy relations with different uh, states like uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, or Philippines. There is another important uh, difference, and it's uh, the perception of uh, these threats. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union was the biggest uh, military threat for democratic countries, and the same was true of the United States. Today, is uh, the situation is much more complex for the United States. Is the China is the biggest uh, threat, the biggest danger? But from the European point of view, uh, China is far away, but Russia is nearby, and. Uh, we should understand this leads to different priorities also in the security uh, policy. Different uh, perceptions uh, uh, also result in different priorities. The international uh, policy will uh, not be dominated by two uh, superpowers, uh, but uh, there is uh, a number of other countries and group of states which take part in this uh, process and uh, which uh, will exert influence on uh, its end result, uh, on its outcome. So if we uh, take a look at the economic uh, situation during the Cold War and today, of course, during the Cold War there were changes, but more or less until the end of the Cold War, the political West had a accounted for uh, 25 uh, percent of the global GDP. The, uh, social uh, uh, block accounted for 7% uh, per of uh, global GDP, and uh, the third world accounted for 18% of GDP. Today, the Western, uh, the West accounts, uh, including um, uh, for uh, uh, Japan uh, and South Korea, uh, around 15%. Uh, the uh, our counterparts uh, it account for 20 percent, and today uh, what we uh, call the global south uh, accounts for 30 percent. So today, today uh, NATO and its uh, partners accounted for 70 percent, uh, and uh, today just 30 percent. And now we see uh, uh, the change in uh, uh, this uh, correlation, and it's a, a significant difference uh, to uh, what uh, we had during the Cold War. But. Uh, what does it mean? We should understand that it's not all about the conflict and rivalry. The spectrum is much uh, bigger, uh, starting from uh, cooperation uh, between uh, countries uh, to uh, competition and to uh, conflicts uh, in various uh, forms and it intensi intensity, intensity. And it affects various sectors. and. Uh, in uh, some sectors, uh, there might be uh, some uh, cooperation, competition, or even conflict. It's not uh, all about military f capabilities. It's not only about economic uh, uh, growth and prosperity. We are talking about uh, technological advantages, uh, regional dominance, and uh, Often, what is sometimes uh, forgotten, uh, cultural um, attractivity 
And uh, here we can, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, there was a dialogical uh, conflict, uh, disputes, uh, but um, it was clear that um, the West uh, offered a uh, prospering model, um, and now uh, China offers a new uh, prospering model, um, which is alternative to the Western one, and uh, this uh, competition is uh, shortened or uh, shortly described as a competition between good and evil. And this uh, take is not uh, precise, is not uh, valid, especially if uh, we take a look at uh, the countries in the Global South, for example, uh, India, Brazil or South Africa, which uh, are not perfect democracies uh, as such, but uh, at least uh, they belong to the democratic uh, camp, but they are not uh, unequivocally on the side of the West, which uh, can be demonstrated or which we can uh, see on their reaction uh, uh, on the, uh, the war uh, of Russia against Ukraine. They are testing out how far they can go, and they do so simultaneously and in a concerted effort. Up to today, Beijing has not condemned Russia's attack on Ukraine. It's still supporting the Kremlin diplomatically and economically. Iran supplies Russia with drones for the war in Ukraine. Peking is putting Taiwan under increasing pressure, exacerbating territorial conflicts with partners in the South China Sea. Europe has not been paying a lot of attention to this, but in October there was another incident. Two Philippine boats of the Coast Guard were rammed by a Chinese patrol boat. You can say, oh, that was just an accident, but many interpreted this differently. It was just a test. How far can we go? How will everyone else react? How will the U.S. react to such a provocation? What unites these three is their anti-Western policy. And this is something which is becoming more and more evident. The rules-based world order adopted or rather created by the West after 45 is perceived as unfair, not just, and dominated by the West, by them. And these anti-Western narratives are taken seriously in the global south. Many people in Africa, Latin America, and Asia are fed up with the empty promises of globalization and economy made by the West. And this is where anti-Western propaganda hits fertile ground. Taking this into account, it becomes clear that the confrontation with China, Iran, and Russia is a confrontation or rather a competition for the support of the global south. We both sides seek support. If we want this type of support, we will need to take these countries seriously. But let me repeat, there is no alliance between China, Iran, and Russia. This is not a bloc. Threat perceptions vary not only in the West, but also among those three. They uh, have some overlapping goals, but their ideas about the desired end state differ vastly. China wants to be the number one, the 
global leader. Russia opts for a multipolar world. Multipolar interpreted in the Russian way. And this interpretation might differ from those of smaller states. What the Kremlin wants is a world in which a handful of major powers dominate in their sphere of influence, dominant over other countries. So the United States need to be pushed back into their Western Hemisphere. Following this logic, Europe falls under the Russian sphere of influence. What does this mean for NATO? What does this mean for Europe? The conflicts in Europe, in the Near and Middle East, seem far apart. But at a strategic level, they are connected. And now I hope we will have the opportunity to become aware of this. Whether it's Ukraine, Israel, or Taiwan, in all three conflicts, an authoritarian regime tries to force a smaller regime down to its knees in order to become stronger as compared to the West. So the West is under pressure from various sides. So the war on Ukraine, the pressure on Taiwan, the war in Israel, that's a challenge for the whole West, for the Western world. But the consequences are different for us in Europe than in the United States. The United States is involved militarily in Europe and in the Near East and being challenged by China in the Far East. Now, what if the conflicts in the South China Sea escalate? Of course, let me repeat this, we Europeans have to take up more responsibility, so we don't really have to repeat this in this panel, but that's not good enough. We need to find our role as Europeans side by side with our US and Indo-Pacific partners. And now we have the opportunity to discuss this question in more detail. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this strategic overview and your assessment. We have discussed uh, several conflicts and crisis regions, and you have linked these and put them into a geopolitical context. Thank you for that, and welcome to our last panel today. First of all, a great compliment for your endurance, for having remained. Well, some have left already, but thank you for still being around for this last panel. Colonel Hagemann has already been introduced as the uh, senior um, German representative of the Marshall Center. Let me introduce Fritz Felgenhauer from the Felgentreu, excuse me, from the 
SPD parliamentary group. He was a member of the Bundeswehr between 2013 and 2021 and also a member of the Defense Committee. Between 2018 and 21, he was the defense policy spokesperson of the SPD parliamentary group. Within the SPD, he was the uh, deputy state chair in Berlin. He, you are also the federal chair of what is called the Reichsbanner Schwarz-Rot-Gold Association of Active Democrats and you are a board member of the German Atlantic Association. Dr. Felgentreu was a high school uh, teacher, a philologist, teaching Latin and ancient Greek and what I find quite impressive and after fulfilling his mandate in Parliament he returned to teaching. Let me also introduce Helena Legarda. She is going to speak English in this uh, panel. She understands German, yeah, but just in case so we offer interpretation. She is the lead analyst of MERIX, that's the Mercator Institute for China Studies in Berlin. Many of you will be familiar with it and she focuses on Chinese foreign defense and security policy in her research. She has a master's degree in public policy of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government with a focus on global and international affairs and a BA in China studies from Oxford University. Now that's impressive. Her career has included working for a Chinese research and consulting firm in Beijing and she was a member of the European Union delegation to China. Thank you for joining us. And let me welcome Mr. Gunnar Wiegand online. I hope you can hear us. I don't know whether, yes, we can see you, we can hear you. Between 2016 until this fall, he was the EU Managing Director Asia Pacific at the European External Action Service. So he was involved in many new strategic impulses for the EU's foreign policy. Among others, he is the uh, author for the new policy towards China 2019, India 2018, the cooperation strategy of the EU with the Indo-Pacific 2021 and the activation of EU relations with Pakistan. And he was the chief diplomat for the Asia-Europe meetings and also responsible for contacts of the EU and ASEAN. And today he is a visiting professor of uh, the European College of Europe in uh, Bruges, also at Sciences Po, and a uh, visiting distinguished fellow at the German Marshall Fund, not to be confused with the Marshall Center, for the Indo-Pacific program. Thank you for joining us. I have two questions each to every panelist. Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the conflict in the Near East, the conflict in Israel, the current threat. 
against Taiwan by China. So how should we handle this, we in Germany? As Karl Hagemann already said, we are now in the process of understanding how political power is divided in the world. So we will have to play a role as Germany, one of the most important and largest nations in uh, Europe. So we have to have a clear concept of how to shape these processes. The Chancellor talked of the uh, turning point, the Zeitenwende, which keeps coming up in public discussion, sometimes misinterpreted, such as the Chancellor has called out a Zeitenwende, so let's see what is going to change as far as, say, the uh, new orientation of the Bundeswehr is concerned. But what is meant is, geopolitically, we live in a new era. The 30 years of peace are more or less over. Conflicts, the number of conflicts are increasing. This is what the Zeitenwende is all about. But it needs to introduce a change in mentality. We need a new awareness of what is happening around us. Only then can we actually provide our own security and find a way of how to sustainably support the alliance. Because since 1956, Membership in the alliance has been a huge plus for us, but also our status in the EU entails new responsibilities. So migration is a huge subject here. This is another area where Germany has to prove itself, so to say. So what do you think the U.S. is expecting? expecting from us, the Europeans. Maybe a united front, which is actually able to provide for its own security and that of its periphery, or maybe even more, that we become committed to conflicts outside of Europe. OK, we cannot really talk about the US. Today's leadership differs from the last Biden's government. Well, in that case, what you pointed at is correct. Biden needs a reliable, wants a reliable, strong partner, a partner which eases the burden put on the United States. So the U.S. will be able to become more active in containing China. But on the other side of the political um, world in the US, I'm talking about the more radical Republicans, what do they expect? I don't know. But I found it was very interesting when the different candidates for presidency we're talking before uh, in front of the Congress, and all of them put a question mark behind NATO. Well, we found it shocking eight, nine years ago when Trump said NATO has become obsolete. Well, all Republicans seem to share that view, maybe not it doesn't apply to each and every one who's been around in Congress for a long time, time. But this is, I think, somewhat 
worrisome. So if one of these candidates makes it to the White House, then hmm, we might have to reconsider our option because these people are not interested in a strong European Union. They couldn't care less. They're interested in bilateral relations to uh, cherry-picked partners. So this is more bilateral relations, US-Poland, who's the chef, who's the waiter. That's been clear from the very beginning. And this is very much to the Republican Party's liking. But both camps no longer understand why one of the largest countries in Europe is not able to become at least number two, considering the size of its armed forces. So we in Germany have to pull our weight. China, den Krieg Russlands gegen die Ukraine zum eigenen Nutzen, als eigenen Nutzen betrachtet, ähm, als günstige Gelegenheit oder ob das eher abträglich für die eigenen Ziele sind. Helena, is Russia's war against Ukraine an advantage or disadvantage for China's ambition to become the world's leading power? Thank you, Katrin, and thank you everyone for, for sticking with us throughout the whole day. Um, China on, on Ukraine. The, the first thing to be said, and I'm sure everybody in the room will have noticed this, China has not been particularly neutral when it comes to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. For all the rhetoric about uh, China displaying uh, quote-unquote pro-Russian neutrality, that neutrality hasn't exactly been there. We've seen China echoing and helping spread Russia's rhetoric. Uh, blaming NATO uh, and the United States for instigating the conflict and for um, effectively making it worse as it went along. We've seen Chinese language around how all sides uh, need, is needing to stop hostilities. And of course, as was mentioned before, we've also seen um, Chinese exports of dual-use technology and components to Russia increase over the, the past few months, of course, always staying below the threshold um, of supplying weaponry, which could trigger uh, sanctions. So we're talking dual-use tech, we're talking drones, but commercial drones, not military drones, um, and we're talking smaller components, such as tires for, for vehicles, boots, helmets, vests, uniforms, etc. Um, China's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine is very geopolitical in nature. It is not just about the future of Ukraine. It is rather about how Beijing wants to position itself vis-a-vis -vis the US, vis-a-vis -vis NATO, or the quote-unquote West at large, and vis-a-vis -vis Russia in the future. And this becomes very obvious when you look at um, statements or comments coming out of meetings between uh, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. Um, in one of the recent meetings, Xi Jinping told Putin that the world was experiencing changes unseen in a century, which is a very um, Chinese phrase that Xi has used many times before, and that China and Russia were the driving forces behind these, these changes. That partnership is very solid, and it's an extremely geopolitical partnership. That being said, we have to also acknowledge the fact that the war ongoing in Ukraine isn't necessarily a good thing for China, per se. It's had a very negative impact on China's relations with the European Union. Oh. It's, further, it's added further tension uh, to US-China ties, and all of this against the background of uh, a Chinese economy that is slowing down. Uh, and struggling with, with quite a number of domestic crises. There is, um, I guess, some small silver, li silver lining for Beijing here, which is the fact that it is leveraging the ongoing war in Ukraine to try and improve its image and its influence across the global south. But overall, I think what we're seeing is Beijing 
trying to, in a way, square the circle and trying to find the balance between all of its interest in maintaining stable relations with Europe and with the US while still staying close to Moscow and supporting President Putin. That's where this awkward balance tends to come from. So I think it, it, there's no direct answer as to whether this war is a good or a bad thing for Beijing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do you sieht sie irgendeine Rolle für China in der Vermittlung der gegenwärtigen Krise in Nahost? Do you see any role for China in the current crisis in the Middle East? The short answer is most likely not. Um, let me elaborate here. Um, again, China's response to, the, to Hamas's attack on Israel and to the ongoing uh, conflict or war in, in Gaza has been very reminiscent of its Ukraine playbook, right? So the response and the rhetoric, if you compare it, has been quite similar. We get a similar um, blaming of, of Western countries. We get a very similar call on all sides to cease hostilities, and we get a very similar refusal to condemn the initial attack by, by Hamas. We also get a similar offer to quote unquote mediate. Um, China's special envoy to the Middle East recently said that China will do anything uh, in its power to restore peace. Um, and Xi Jinping just a few months ago released a three point plan for the Israel-Palestine conflict, right? So the offer is theoretically on the table. What we are not seeing, however, is any willingness or, in a way, capacity by China to get into the details or to expose itself to the risks and responsibilities then that real mediation would involve. Uh, if we talk about the peace plan that Xi Jinping released in June, when uh, the head of the Palestinian Authority, Abbas, was in, in Beijing, it's not the first one. Since 2003, there's been at least four similar peace plans with varying numbers of points, ranging from a three-point plan all the way to a five-point plan. Uh, the points in all these plans are largely similar, and they are quite vague and generic. Um, and I can't quote off the top of my head because I don't remember exactly, but I'm talking about points to the effect of the international community needs to be more responsible, Israel and Palestine need a two, we need a two-state solution. So that's the level that we're talking about. Um, so. The plan, the mediation plan, is not a real mediation plan, and it's not very actionable. And on the other hand, we also need to acknowledge the fact that Beijing has little to no experience with conflict mediation in the past, and therefore very limited capacity. And second, that Beijing has not really demonstrated willingness to do it. Uh, and part of the reason behind this is that China is very unlikely, in the Middle East in particular, to be accepted as an honest broker by both sides. In particular, as it continues to refuse to condemn Hamas, which is something that would be a prerequisite for Israel to accept China as a mediator in, in any way. In Beijing is effectively hoping to protect its footprint and influence in, in the region by maintaining its good ties with Arab partners and with Iran, even at the risk of irritating its relations with Israel, because this is particularly important as it tries to build an alternative power base in, in the Global South, as Dr. Hagemann mentioned earlier. So active mediation seems out of the question, but what I think this conflict will do is it will test the strength of Beijing's relations with countries in the region, and it will expose, I believe, the limitations of China's rhetoric. It will expose the limitations of China's willingness and ability to actually lean on its regional partners to try and prevent further escalation. So that is, I think, the space to watch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Herr Wiegand. Mr. Wiegand, what's the take of the European Union on this? Where does it fit in in this strategic competition already mentioned by Colonel Hagemann? What would be the economic security policy or overall political dimension? Thank you. 
Hello from Brussels. While Minister Pistorius gave his speech this morning, at the same time, the High Representative talked to the uh, ambassadors from our 145 missions around the world. He talked about global disorder and crisis and that things have become more dramatic with the latest wars and crises. And he pointed something out which I would like to mention first in my remarks already mentioned by Felgentoy. There is this strategic competition or rivalry in an increasingly multipolar system. It seemed in the 90s that democracies had won that we would enter the phase of a unipolar world. And now we have this other well, it was, it is now apparent that the tendency is actually towards more multipolarity. And we, the Europeans, have never been strictly against multipolarity because we want to be one of these poles in this world. And that's actually what we are. But. We stand for a multilateral order. Otherwise, multipolarity is just a euphemism for the return to traditional power politics, where the big ones create spheres of influence and the others just do their bidding. So multilateralism the same rules applying to everyone. This is what the European Union stands for. This is what the new order looks like to us. Or rather, this is what it should be. And these rules should apply in the same way for large states and small states. But other powers are, are opposed to this. They don't much like this. And a, a joint statement by China and Russia read out during the Olympics when uh, Putin went to Pe Beijing. Before the attack on Ukraine, this is an 11 page statement. And this is basically the expression of those two states' idea about what a new world order should look like and how the spheres of influence should be distributed with Russia and China supporting each other. And they claim they know better what democracy is all about and human rights since they are the more, more ancient civilizations. Well. <clears throat> Maybe not everyone in uh, the world would agree. Not everyone would be happy with this with this system to be exported to everyone else. So the EU is not talking about a strategic competition with China, but a systemic competition. This is the EU's take on this. There are several countries, say Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, Nigeria, Pakistan, Indonesia, Malaysia. There are many countries in this world, they don't want to belong to one side's sphere of influence. And they do not need a new interpretation of what democracy and human rights actually mean. But these are the countries that we need to take seriously. And this is the EU's approach. And the European Union is the most successful peace project ever in the world. A lot of prosperity, many members, a lot to be proud of. And what the EU has done, it's not only 
offering massive support in the form of ammunition or arms deliveries. It's also a welcome to millions of refugees, financial support, and all of this training the military. Germany taken an important role in this, and all of this makes the EU a geopolitical actor which makes a stronger appearance today than it used to do. Concerning longer uh, term and geopolitical orientation, uh, China, as far as China goes, we uh, cannot only pay attention uh, to eco uh, ec economic uh, or uh, political or uh, military uh, uh, aspects uh, and uh, the China, uh, China uh, the Ch poses a bigger a uh, more complex uh, challenge uh, and we need a comprehensive approach uh, here uh, where all aspects are considered all together and it's something uh, w which is very difficult to understand uh, here in uh, Germany so especially uh, one more question uh, concerning the uh, corona uh, pandemics uh, and uh, the war uh, of Russia against uh, Ukraine spawned uh, significant uh, doubts and uh, concerns um, uh, concerning the uh, supply chains uh, and uh, now we talk a lot uh, about de-risking or even uh, decoupling uh, uh, reduction of dependencies uh, so uh, for example in the European Union uh, there was a talk about the decoupling uh, uh, from China in order to nim minimize uh, risks. Uh, so, my question is, uh, what are the specific uh, plans or uh, considerations of the European Union in order uh, to reduce such dependencies, uh, uh, especially in uh, regard uh, to uh, China? So uh, the whole uh, started uh, in the field of security uh, policy uh, in terms of uh, bigger just strategic um, autonomy and uh, then during the uh, corona uh, pandemics um, uh, many people uh, started uh, asking uh, how it can be possible that the protective uh, masks uh, that we were supposed uh, to uh, uh, wear were not produced um, in uh, our region but were uh, supplied. Of course, it's a uh, many sectors of our economy depended uh, or depend on uh, supply chains, chains and. Uh, uh, now we talk uh, about a digital transition, green transition, and here uh, we are largely dependent uh, from whom? From uh, China, in terms of uh, supplies of uh, raw materials. Uh, uh, if we talk, uh, be it uh, uh, batteries uh, and uh, other uh, parts. Uh, everyone understood uh, that uh, and of course uh, here the industries uh, must react uh, also and uh, a number of um, measures uh, uh, can be envisaged, uh, envisaged uh, here and uh, of course uh, the industry our economy must diversify their sources of supplies uh, and here our ministries uh, uh, try to contact uh, and develop relations uh, with other countries uh, in Asia, in uh, Africa, uh, in order to diversify, to multiply the uh, sources uh, so that we would not uh, stay or develop new dependencies. Uh, we mentioned uh, lithium uh, here uh, and uh, 
it's one uh, of the examples uh, here. Of course, uh, diversification is a uh, very important topic here in this regard, de-risking, uh, decoupling. If, uh, We uh, need a new orientation um, in order to redirect uh, our exports uh, or our investment. And here the Commission uh, prepared uh, a paper on economic uh, security. Where uh, there might be a unacceptable uh, dependencies or uh, where uh, we can uh, export uh, our technologies. Uh, such uh, discussions are also uh, taking place in the United States uh, and um, uh, our uh, members of the European Union uh, should consider these issues as well. Uh, and uh, uh, such is issues uh, uh, as a screening uh, of incoming investment, but uh, what uh, can we do uh, about uh, our investments as that go out of the European Union? And uh, the last point which I would like to mention, the uh, industries uh, which we would like to develop in Europe, uh, for example, uh, in the production of semiconductors. Uh, of course, uh, I my appeal goes uh, to you, to uh, the audience, uh, to think about uh, your questions. Um, I would like to pose uh, two questions uh, to Colonel Hageman. Uh, so, what are the chances, uh, what uh, uh, possibilities uh, do uh, the countries from the Global South have in order to position the, uh, themselves uh, in this geostrategic competition? They differ from country to country, uh, but uh, let us take India as example. India considers itself a democratic country, but uh, for a long time it has a very ambivalent uh, attitude uh, towards uh, the West based uh, due to its uh, colonial uh, past. Uh, at the same time, uh, India has a has long established uh, relations uh, to uh, Russia. Uh, someone uh, said that 60% uh, of arms uh, come uh, into India from uh, Russia. And uh, this is the reason uh, for criticism, uh, criticism from Europe, uh, from uh, the West. and. Uh, uh, India disagrees with it. Uh, they, uh, India says that uh, it's um, a hypocrisy because uh, the West, the Western uh, countries, also have um, uh, partnerships or relations uh, with uh, countries uh, which are not democratic uh, in cases where it suits uh, the West well, and uh, at the same time. India procures um, newest uh, arms uh, from uh, Russia at a very good uh, price. So uh, India, of course, uh, uses this opportunity to maintain uh, its own interests. Uh, and of course, we are talking about not only material uh, interests. Um, and here uh, we come to talk about uh, China. India believes uh, that uh, the Western attempts to isolate uh, Russia are uh, wrong. Um, uh, Russia is, uh, is thus uh, pushed into the arms of China. What? is China doing uh, here for a long uh, time? 
China is a uh, has been a problem for the Indian security. Security. Uh, they had uh, border uh, conflicts in Himalaya, and uh, just in July, in 2020, there was a border uh, conflict uh, uh, when uh, 20 Indian soldiers were killed. And against this backdrop. Uh, India is interested in good relations with uh, Russia and uh, not uh, to push uh, it into the arms of China. At the same time, on the other side, from the other side, uh, India sees good chances uh, in this strategic competition rivalry after the situation uh, after the situation escalated, uh, India had uh, consultation, consultations with the United States, and it's a clear message towards Beijing. Uh, we see here that uh, India, uh, India has very deliberately reflected on its uh, role as a Ge geostrategic player uh, and uh, the cooperation with the West is very important for India and it intensified uh, the uh, cooperation uh, within the strategic dialogue uh, and India and uh, three other countries uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, space which uh, are leaning uh, forward. They cooperate closely. And uh, at the same time, uh, India would like uh, to use the chances which uh, open uh, between uh, those uh, blocks. And we know about the cooperation um, in the field of uh, uh, military uh, industry. Uh, so uh, India tries uh, to cooperate uh, in this field both with Russia and the United States in order uh, to have advantages uh, in uh, both forms of cooperation. And uh, so we uh, must uh, try to uh, uh, consider this, to take this into consideration. It's very interesting uh, that uh, uh, we uh, have this illustration, this example of uh, such country. Uh, let us uh, start uh, with uh, the Q&A session, uh, Brian, then you and the third. I always prefer to uh, have three questions. Uh, please introduce uh, yourself and uh, uh, whom you would like to ask to uh, BRICS. My question concern, uh, concerns BRICS, what's going on within uh, BRICS, and if we analyze uh, what's going on there, uh, there is uh, a uh, counter uh, a uh, project um, uh, initiated by the G20 with the Afri uh, African Union. So, what is the associating countries um, uh, of the BRICS? Um, maybe there might be uh, some other new alliances. Uh, I think it's quite possible, and we heard it here. Uh, Colonel Hageman also said it, uh, that we should have a more um, balanced approach to maybe in the Marshall Center or in other institutions. Maybe uh, this uh, situation has been analyzed um, concerning uh, this development. Thank you. I'm from Würzburg. Um, uh, my question uh, is uh, for uh, Mr. Uh, Gunnard, uh, and uh, uh, 
the meetings between Europe and Asia still relevant or um, as Europe uh, we should have a, a strategic uh, uh, approach uh, to uh, in the uh, Pacific uh, space and the third question I am from the Potsdam working group uh, in um, for the security you mentioned India and China uh, but uh, another question is Taiwan but if we think that uh, half of the containers are uh, shipped uh, through the Straits of Taiwan 90% uh, of um, uh, chips are produced in Taiwan uh, and uh, China is uh, testing the uh, airspace of uh, Taiwan and the military exercises uh, are increasing both in quantity and in quality uh, and uh, Xi Jinping uh, raises the issue um, again and again. So my question is uh, uh, what uh, we Europeans will do in case uh, of an invasion of Taiwan? So the uh, question is uh, uh, BRICS uh, and uh, uh, the enlargement of BRICS in um, happy to, ha to have a first time at it. I think it's a great question and BRICS is one of those formats that I think we spent a few years not paying a lot of attention to, because it looked like it was sidelined somewhat. We're seeing clearly a renewed push, um, not just to expand it, but also to sort of reformalize it, institutionalize it further, and to, and to make it um, sort of more relevant internationally. The, the concern with BRICS for me, and something that I think we need to keep in mind, is linked to this issue of the different perspectives that Global South countries have, right? So China very clearly looks at BRICS as a geopolitical body that it would like to have compete with the G7. Uh, and this is where a lot of these initiatives come from. Not all of the other members of BRICS look at BRICS in this same way. Uh, therefore, I think that China is going to run into quite a number of obstacles if it tries to turn BRICS into sort of a geopolitical body or it tries to bring BRICS into its own sphere of influence. And this also means that the further that BRICS expands, um, I think the likelier it will be that they will run into trouble coming to decisions or actually managing to implement any of these initiatives or plans. Because there doesn't seem to be a very clear identity or strategic objective for, for the group. And that, to me, is, is a key issue here. There's no shared set of values or, or principles, I think, underpinning BRICS at this point. It's mostly a sort of an economic consideration that Beijing is trying to turn geopolitical. Uh, so I think it's something that we need to take seriously, and we need to take it seriously also because of what, what it signals, precisely because it signals China's ambition to build a, an alternative power base in the global south and compete with the west. But I think we need to not overdo it in terms of considering BRICS immediately already a direct competitor to, to the G7, for example. Thank you, Helena. Die zweite Frage ging an Herr the second question was uh, for Mr. Wigan, uh, so the importance of uh, European and Asian meetings today. Hans-Dieter Genscher uh, uh, started this initiative uh, every two years. We had such uh, summits uh, since uh, uh, then. The EU uh, members uh, and, uh, by the way, other um, uh, European countries like Norway, uh, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and uh, Asian uh, partners. And uh, then this uh, venue was expanded, this forum was expanded by uh, 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 Russia, and uh, after the invasion of uh, Ukraine, we 
uh, tried to suspend the Russian uh, membership uh, and uh, then uh, the uh, Asian uh, process or uh, Asian European uh, uh, meeting uh, is not uh, working uh, right now with the exception of the uh, Eurasian Foundation which is in Singapore and uh, it's uh, very interesting because uh, Uh, later in this uh, month, uh, we'll uh, have an APEC uh, summit in California uh, where uh, Latin American countries and uh, United States and Canada uh, meet uh, with uh, South uh, Asian partners and China and uh, Russia will be uh, also represented there. And uh, we uh, uh, for us, it's unacceptable. And uh, then we developed a strategy for cooperation with our partners uh, in uh, in the Pacific uh, uh, space uh, two days before the Russian aggression uh, in of Ukraine. We had uh, information that the uh, war uh, was about uh, to begin. Uh, we had a meeting uh, because it was very important uh, for European and for Asian countries. Uh, since then, we had a meeting of uh, on the level of ministers in Stockholm. And uh, here we have a new uh, space for cooperation from uh, the uh, Almost uh, the majority of partners uh, will take part uh, in, a, in it, who are willing to cooperate in seven important uh, spheres. It uh, does not include uh, China, uh, what was implied by your question, because uh, China uh, declines uh, every uh, uh, kind of um, Indo-Pacific uh, politics, because uh, for them it's a kind of a container politics. Uh, but uh, still, uh, we uh, had uh, bilateral meetings with uh, China, and uh, uh, we uh, will have more meeting. We have an intensive dialogue with China on all uh, levels. Uh, it. Uh, uh, started uh, again. Uh, it does not mean uh, that uh, we'll have uh, uh, more um, uh, in common, but at least we talk. Uh, last question um, for uh, or Colonel Hagemann. Uh, then we have a uh, question uh, from online. Colonel Hagemann, so what does an escalation of the situation in South Chinese uh, Sea, or uh, what, uh, how can we react uh, in case of um, an invasion of uh, Taiwan? It's an interesting question. First of all, we must uh, say that from the Chinese uh, that uh, Taiwan is uh, conceded uh, from the Chinese point of view against the backdrop of what going on um, in Ukraine. Putin assumed that uh, uh, Ukraine would be an easy uh, task to fulfill, uh, but it was not the case. Uh, uh, it was, he was surprised by the Ukrainian resolve and by the determined uh, reaction uh, from the West. And, of course, uh, China uh, keeps uh, this in mind. From the Chinese point of view, uh, China watches uh, closely uh, how West is uh, supporting uh, a small uh, country and the outcome of the conflict in Europe uh, will have an influence on uh, how uh, China will uh, act. It will uh, depend uh, 
on uh, whether the West would be able to uh, deter uh, China uh, from uh, such uh, acts, uh, or, and uh, Ukraine is not a NATO uh, member. That's why NATO uh, has not uh, failed in Ukraine. But our efforts uh, to deter Russia from uh, the aggression was uh, not uh, successful. And here we must uh, undertake credible efforts. Uh, so uh, that uh, China would be convinced that um, uh, the uh, invasion of Taiwan would result in a united and determined response from the West. Of course, we uh, understand uh, there is an understanding in Europe and the United States that we uh, should take a strategic approach uh, to such uh, problems. And, of course, uh, the West, uh, how we will react, it's an open uh, question. The flexible response of NATO uh, was um, designed uh, to demonstrate our resolve, but at the same time to uh, uh, have uh, all uh, possible uh, means uh, at our disposal so that uh, our opponent uh, wouldn't be uncertain. So uh, uh, climate uh, change, um, is how can we avoid uh, the emergence of political blocks because uh, the climate change, the problem of the climate change uh, can uh, be uh, resolved only by our united efforts. I agree with what Colonel Hagemann said. A lot depends on what is going to happen further in Ukraine. So, if Russia can be pushed back in its attempt to conquer another territory violating international law if this aggressive policy is not successful if uh, moscow's model of a new um, political uh, order by swallowing smaller states if this fails well, then Russia will not uh, necessarily change its political course overnight. No, maybe not ever, but maybe the old model of a rules-based order, if a model based on cooperation, well, this might after all, look like the better one. But if things continue to develop in a direction of multipolarity, according to the Russian interpretation of it, then we are back to a disastrous model of power politics only. Thank you for your patience. You've been standing, waiting there for quite a while. Okay, we've all been sitting for too long, but still. Two questions from that side and one more from the other side. Katja Gardner, Gator Group, Film Productions. My question goes to Colonel Hagemann or maybe all panelists. Not only the BRICS state and the abolition of the petrodollar aren't their very existence a threat to uh, uh, the powerful position of the U.S.? I study at the School of International Events. And I'd like to ask you to assess the Chinese willingness to actually confront um, the West in the sense that there's a lot of economic inter interdependence. Um, you already touched upon it in your um, short input because they are also struggling to keep their growth uh, going and 
judging from this interdependence, I'd like to have a small assessment how big that willingness or how far the Chinese actually want to go in economic terms. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Vielen Dank. Ja, hallo, Aaron Wilkamer, mein Name ist. I have a question for Mr. Wiegand. You talked about the states caught between the zones of influence of China and the West and don't want to join any sphere of influence. What is their outlook for the future? So let me, the petrodollar and the BRICS states, that was for Colonel Hagemann. I'm not an economist, not an expert on economics, but one thing is striking because strategic competition takes place in the economy and there is an interest in weakening the West by the states we talked about. So they no longer want to have the dollar as the lead currency in worldwide economics. So there have been changes already. With möglichst vielen partners, but India is first. And this Ganze is natürlich auf einem Dekolonialisierungsansatz aufgebaut, auf einer, uh, auf einer Reduzierung der Abhängigkeit vom Westen. Uh, und das ist eben die Geschichte, die die meisten dieser Länder hatten. Und deswegen uh, sollten wir auf gar keinen Fall denken, dass wir jetzt nur in einer intensiven Auseinandersetzung sind mit China und oder Russland um, und vielleicht noch ein, zwei andere Länder, sondern dass wir uns ganz intensiv bemühen müssen um diesen sogenannten globalen Süden und genau zuhören müssen und eingehen müssen auf die individuellen äh, 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 Wünsche und Notwendigkeiten mit einem guten Kooperationsangebot. Äh, ich glaube, dass da äh, kein, äh, äh, keine Resignation einsetzen sollte, sondern dass das heutzutage einfach sehr viel äh, weniger ein Lagerdenken ist als ein Emanzipationsdenken. Vielen Dank. So, ich möchte zum Abschluss sehr, sehr sportlich werden. Ähm, ich nehme alle vier Fragen, wenn sie kurz, knapp und präzise sind. Very brief. Pief, very brief, a 15 second answer, otherwise we'll have a time overrun. Okay, Colonel Hagemann, you said the Global South is becoming increasingly important. I'm from Mexico. <laughs> Sometimes the Global South, however, is still lacking competence, if you will. So what we uh, need is to get better training, education, possibilities. And NATO in Asia. So the first part is that um, no, we know that NATO sort of shelved its plan for a Tokyo office to further engage and implement its policies in Asia. But given the, the lack of industrial, we know that NATO countries have a problem with um, industrializing its weapon systems, manufacturing weapon system, the constraints that it has with Ukraine. Um, where does East Asian countries fit in all of this? You know, we know that um, Poland is buying tanks from South Korea. We know America is engaging South Korean and Japanese shipyards. You know, can there be greater economic coordination with Asian countries, General? So that's the first part. The second part is regarding mm. the EU. One part only, please. Okay, sorry. Can you stop here? Yeah. You don't take it, yeah? Don't blame me. So, thank you. Next question, please. Yeah, guten Abend, Tara Prela, Österreich. I'm from the Austrian Ministry of Defense. I would like to know, how do you assess a possible cooperation with ASEAN and countries in the Indo-Pacific, although most of these countries are not exactly picture book democracies. I uh, also study at the Hertis School. I use a shared colonial past as a narrative in their foreign policy. Thank you. Okay. Das wird schwierig. Uh, die erste Frage beantworte ich. Okay, this is going to be difficult. I'm going to answer the first question, and I think competence, knowledge, 
about history, the status quo. We need to learn more and understand the situation of these countries, yes. The second question, the future of EU-NATO partnerships in involving Asia or South Asia, they're interested. And travel diplomacy bears witness to that. So when the Chancellor went to India, this was sending a strong signal. Let's see what's going to happen next. Helena, future of the EU and ASEAN partnerships? I mean, very briefly, that cooperation obviously is there. Um, it will continue but it's incredibly diverse because speaking of ASEAN as a single entity, especially on various policy areas, I think is a little bit of a stretch. So we're talking about Indo-Pacific strategies, for example, there will be more and more cooperation with certain ASEAN member states, perhaps not with ASEAN overall as, a, as an institution, I would say. Thank you to all panelists. Mr. Regant, a round of applause.